Okay, hi everyone, what's up? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Suyin. On this channel, we talk about all things about building a great life and it centers around money, connected relationships, and self-esteem, self-worth. A high one. So I have an exciting announcement for you. On the 24th of June, a Saturday at 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., I am hosting a community event for all people who are interested in personal finance, in relationships, in self-worth, and want to have a dialogue with Dividend Magic and me. And it's going to be in Shalam. It's going to be in Duyamas International School. I'll give you all the details down below. It's a paid event. so. All the proceeds that we are uh, earning from this event, we are giving it to our charity portfolio and it is part of the 1000 bucks challenge. We are building 10,000 ringgit worth of charity portfolio. We're not going to stop there, we're going to keep building it so we can keep giving back to our charity of choice. And I think for now, I'm going to be looking at special needs kids. I have this one in Kuchai Lama that I really care about and I'm so excited. So do join us at the event, it will be in Shalam and I can't wait to see you there. Please come join us in the description box down below. Thank you. Today I'm going to get comfortable. I'm going to talk to you and share with you a little bit about my self-worth journey. I think this is where I want to start. I remember as a kid, I had very, 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 very low self-worth. Okay, that's not entirely true. When I was maybe five? around that age, a bit older, I remember being very vain and very proud of my looks. I was very like much that little girl who loved pretty dresses. I like to pick out my own clothes. I like I like to bully my dad into like buying clothes for me. Yeah, so I remember being that girl. And then in primary school, I really did feel a sense of worthlessness <laughs> so it's not an excuse but in primary school I went to Chinese primary school and I just felt so stupid because I grew up at home speaking English and I had zero interest in learning Mandarin and it just didn't make sense to me why <laughs> I had to be in an environment where I was just told to sit down not talk and I would be punished for getting answers wrong and if the if the question or if the problem in the exam or in the homework was easy then I would get double the amount of caning. So I really I really hated that and I I just ran away from that. Like I just hid myself in class and I didn't I didn't bother learning a lot of things. And then where I really loved it was in English classes where obviously it was very easy for me and I think that's when I started having this mindset of oh I will only shine in the areas where I find it's easy so that's a very dangerous mindset that I picked up because then if anything was uncomfortable for me I didn't uh, I didn't want to do it because I I feared the failure and I fa I feared looking stupid and looking foolish and I feared just judgment of other people. I think that that was really really damaging for me in the long run. <coughs> How it showed up was um off the top of my head in university. Okay, I had very very few friends in the first two years of university. I just stayed at home. I think I, I hung out with like maybe just four people and very seldom. In my third year of uni, I met this most ama amazing bunch of friends. I met Mark, Mark Chua. And he introduced me to the whole bunch of uh, his friends. And they're all like type A. Very alpha male, very smart, very intelligent, good looking. They dance, they party, they, they do everything, right? So what they did was like case competitions. like business case competitions in, in uni and I thought like, oh, that's so cool. And I never dared to do it because I had really low self-esteem of like how I would actually fare in those competitions because, you know, I, I just like, I just kept the stereotype of myself as being like, 
helpless or you know not smart enough blah <laughs> and it is so weird because i don't see that in myself anymore now now i've i'm i'm in my like 30s i just entered my 30s i'm 30 and a half and i i have so much respect for myself and i know that if i don't know something i'm going to do whatever it takes to find out uh, especially if i'm interested in it yeah like this this fire that i now have in me uh is bizarre and i i'm so proud of it i'm so in love with it and i'm falling in love with myself more and more way back then um that that low self-worth would show up in things that <laughs> in things that are very simple like I wouldn't dare to sing in front of other people because I was afraid that I sound bad or like I'm tone deaf or <clears throat> my voice will crack and I didn't dare to dance much I just like awkwardly move my body a bit from side to side and just like uh, like try to like not be noticed and it was so painfully awkward and yeah I, I used uh, alcohol to, to try to get out of my head it didn't really work well I, I was still very very conscious and self-conscious yeah like simple things like taking photos I hated taking photos because I, I didn't know how to pose and I didn't even bother learning how to pose and like just just learning how to be free and uh, learn how to be free just like just being free lah really uh, when it came to things like fun things like board games I have best friends who really really love board games and I never join any games because I'm just like uh yeah I don't think I will be good at that so I'm not I'm not even going to try so this kept showing up in my life and I guess what happened very quickly on was that in my 20s <laughs> when I turned 20 right before I I graduated, I panicked. I had this whole like existential crisis. I started to really like spiral inwards and to feel shitty about myself because I felt like, okay, I've been studying for like three and a half years and I didn't even bother to do an internship. I think I I had it at the back of my mind that I, I should, I should do like a, a job internship before I graduated. So instead of beating myself up what i could have done at that point in time was you know acknowledge that okay i made a choice and and that's it lah. like just move on from like um that that choice that i made to not do the internship instead what i did was i volunteered in chile i went to Antofa antofagasta and el norte de chile and it was like the best experience of my life i cried so much i was so homesick every day and i was so like i was in over my head i was overwhelmed because it was so deafeningly silent um in terms of i was i was, I, I felt so alone because it was only me and my mind because i didn't i didn't speak much spanish at the time pero ahora hablo más español con fluidez pero no con gramática correcta a veces and yeah I, I, it was a period of time where I just had like I had no understanding of conversations that were going around around me because I was speaking in English and everybody else was speaking in Spanish and like really f rapid Spanish so that was when the voices in my head was very very loud and at the same time it was very peaceful uh, being alone being in a new environment being just in a novel place so that's when i realized that i really enjoy freedom no self-worth didn't didn't like cross my mind until i started applying for jobs and when i began applying for jobs i realized that i felt so shitty about myself i didn't have the confidence to actually ask for a higher base salary and i the process of finding a job was quite painful as well because I didn't know what I wanted. I knew I wanted to work in education but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. And I think that's very common, right? It's, it's very common for graduates, like new, new to the workforce. I knew I wanted to make a difference in the world and I knew 
that's truly what I want in my life and I decided to start teaching and then I remember when I had that first salary discussion it was so awkward that I was in IKEA I was on the phone with the CEO and she asked me so how much um, how much do you want to be paid and then I answered back as a question so I said 3,200 <laughs> and like my voice actually went up like that in intonation and that is like the least confident thing that I could do right being and sounding unsure yeah my CEO was like oh okay uh, I'll like mm, let's let's work with 3000 and then I just hesitated there and I just accepted it straight away so that's my base salary that's my first starting salary yeah like I mean everybody gets a different base salary based on how they negotiate and you know like their experiences they have coming in and because I felt so low and so unconfident in my abilities and what I can bring to the table I didn't ask for what I'm actually really worth at that time if I knew what I know now I'm actually super capable I feel like I can connect with people and um, I'm smart and I can do whatever it takes to find out how to be a great teacher and I, I, I do believe I did that. That's not to say I didn't make a lot of mistakes while being a teacher. Yeah, I, I would have negotiated a higher pay. I would have asked for something unreasonable like 5,000 ringgit and we would have negotiated that down. And either way, I would still have, like even if she said no to me, at least I knew I had done whatever it took to ask for what I wanted, truly, what I truly wanted. So after a year of working as an assistant teacher and then uh, roughly a year, maybe, no, I started in April. So that's, yeah, so that's around eight months of assisting. And then I had my first year of classes that were fully my own. So my classes were extreme. I did English, IGCSE and Economics, IGCSE. So I had three English classes, one uh, Economics class and I also did an A-levels uh, economics class. So I had like five classes. The thing about teaching these subjects is they're very essay heavy. So I had 25 students in uh, my English classes. That's like the max capacity for uh, the, the international schools that I taught at, Sri and Duyamas. And then what happened was, yeah, in Duyamas, we had smaller size classes for for economics, I had like three students for A levels and how many? 12? I don't remember. 10? 10, 10 students for economics. So I really, really struggled in, um, in the learning curve. Like the learning curve was super steep as a teacher, a brand new teacher with like different subjects. And I felt so much responsibility over the students. And also, I was like figuring out how to be a teacher and how to be myself around them because there are certain boundaries that I needed to set as an adult, a responsible adult who is a teacher. Yeah, be an adult. Oh yeah, I remember thinking like, they actually trust me as a fresh graduate to, to be front-facing and to be responsible over these impressionable young students. Um, yeah, anyway. Struggling with self-worth and figuring out my career and work <laughs> was a really, really uphill journey for me. But I wouldn't have done it any other way um, now, I guess. Because this were, these were the lessons I needed to learn and now I can actually talk to you about it. About how silly it was um, for me to not, not work on my self-esteem. And... <laughs> and like even like speaking about this now it's so weird because self-esteem is something that I've always always thought of as very abstract and very intangible like how do I actually gain better self-worth and the advice I have is actually pretty simple and very underwhelming so the advice I have for myself on how to grow my self-worth is things like if I am holding myself to an impossible standard, stop it. And if I 
am like blaming myself nonstop and holding on to the pain, for example, holding on to a pain of a nine year relationship that didn't work out and uh, trust issues, all that. I just needed to let go. And these like simple things like let go, stop it, love myself more. It sounds so flippant just to say that, but it is the the thing that has made a very, very big difference right now for me in my healing journey or in my journey to growing my self-worth and self-esteem. Yeah, I was super blessed to have someone in my life, someone special. His name is Kazu. So he is five years older than me and when I was teaching A-levels, he was one of my colleagues uh, with another um, with another one, her name's Cynthia. And we decided to work on the A-level program together because as I mentioned, three students in an economics class is unacceptable. The previous batch had one student. So the A-levels uh, group, A-levels group, the A-level program was really suffering. And what Kazu decided to do was um, work together the three of us, we banded together to figure out how to increase the numbers for our A-level program and we did whatever it took. We were doing sales and marketing, uh, we started a Facebook page, Instagram page, we took students on trips, we designed how to bond and how to build a culture around the A-level program. We we push them to make initiatives like, um, what do they call it? I don't remember what it's called, but it's like Hari Kantin, where the students, uh, their entrepreneurial school, right? The first entrepreneurial school in Malaysia. So the A-level team actually started the Duya Mas Bazaar, where the kids will go and sell things and hone their entrepreneurial spirit and skills and <laughs> like just just power through with that. And we also threw the farewells for the graduating classes, which were epic failures, to be honest, for many, many of the years that um, uh, people were organizing farewells. And we threw insane, insane ones, like combining all three schools. Yeah, like Kazu was actually the person that I did a lot of my financial education with. He taught me a lot about how to look at REITs and EPF, like EPF, I invest. He taught me so many things, but that, those were like mainly for finances. Like he talked a lot about mutual funds and stocks. And then I learned lessons about self-worth from him. So he was giving me and Cynthia a lot of just like conversations and sharings about how he has a really, really big sense of self and he allows himself to dream and he is able to connect with that part of himself where he knows how capable he is. He, he knows that he's willing to do whatever it takes to to learn and to get results and to make a lot of money. And then at that point in time when I was 23, 24, 25 years old even when I left teaching, I was like, how? How am I gonna do all of this? Like, how am I gonna earn 10,000 ringgit a month when I was just earning less than five a month? So I think a lot of things that Kazu taught me back then, I didn't learn and I didn't internalize fully. So it, it took me a lot of years. So I think like this this whole self-worth, <laughs> this whole self-worth, self-esteem lessons, it can be learned through really hard times. Um, it can be learned through really, really hard times. And I will share with you in a separate video. The, the thing that really showed me how low my self-worth was, was my recent breakup. And I'll tell you all about it. Um, yeah, it, it got really, really scary for me in terms of like the thoughts that I was thinking. Uh, for example, I thought that I was uninteresting. I thought, what, like, why would my friends even care about me? 
there are so many other people that they're better off caring for. Yeah, like it just got really, really dark. And like going there showed me that I needed to, to love myself, to know how much I want to be here on this earth and to know how much my friends love me and my family loves me and really uh, to know how much that I actually do love myself and I'm capable, I'm strong, I'm free, I'm, I can make these choices for myself. Yeah, I, I guess I'm gonna leave you here today. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you for watching the video. I hope you got value out of it and again, I want to hit 50,000 subscribers and impact all these people. So please remember to share the video uh, if it helped you or if you think it will help someone. Share, like, subscribe, comment. Yeah, thank you. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.